what I, what I find students don't do is they, they hasten to, to um, they think that's just going to come to them. When I flip to your work and I look to see what you guys try and do, you're great at mimicking something you've seen before. You're less good at trying to analyze a situation and bring some concept to bear. So here's the chain, just dangling straight. And to, to help understand this, I'm going to put another line here to indicate where the lowest point in the problem is. It's, it's right here, isn't it? This would be the lowest point in the problem. I'm saying this because we're going to begin to lift the chain up, and we're lifting the chain up by grabbing the bottom of it and pulling it upwards. So there is going to be in the future a situation in which the chain I need to get this to look just right. The chain will have been pulled upwards this distance. Now it's important to realize that if we're trying to figure out how much work is done in lifting the chain, uh, understanding the displacement that takes place compared to the amount of force required is going to be a, a, a portion of how you'll have to calculate that work. So if I have lifted and now have bent that much chain, I had to go twice that far to get it there. I'm trying to compare how much chain I have that I'm lifting with how far I had to move my hand in lifting the chain upwards. You understand what I'm looking at here? Uh, this will be the delta x portion of calculating the, the work done. I'm pretty sure when I calculate the work, I'm going to have to go from zero all the way to L, the length of the chain. I mean, if I grab here and want to lift this and hook it up there, I will have to move the entire length of the chain. But I don't think I am supporting the weight of the entire length. I think I'm only supporting this portion of the chain. And I think the hook over here is supporting the other portion of the chain. So I need a, a way to relate that because you guys who know calculus know that if I'm integrating over x, I'm going to have to find a way of expressing the force in terms of x. And actually, I don't know that you guys in calculus know that. My experience with calculus is that it's very similar to what you guys do here, which is if I give you an integral already ready to go, you might be able to do the calculus. Setting up the integral, you guys are terrible at it because you don't learn that in calculus. Calculus is just the part where you execute it, where you do the antiderivative. Yes. All right, so that's been the pro that's a problem that you guys have. And you don't know that you have it yet because you haven't had to assemble an integral. This is something that we are going to have to learn. That's our next semester problem. Executing the integral isn't worth anything but a point maybe on the whole test. Assembling the integral is. And this is why, again, we have a problem. You guys who have finished A, B, and are in B, C, you should be able to do this. But the skill set's just not taught in calculus. And you guys who have been in E and M understand assembling the, the integral. That's everything. That, that, that's the hard part. Um, executing the integral, that's like learning your times tables. And I know you don't feel that way. When you're in calculus, it feels like it's way complicated. It's not. That's the simplest part is, is executing the integral. So you have to find a way of writing this force in terms of how far you've pulled up the chain. So the first thing I would probably say to you is when we look here, we are only supporting this amount of chain. That's the amount that's on our side, the side that we're pulling on. The ceiling is supporting this amount of chain. Everybody follow along? 
By the time we get to the top, I would expect that you guys could agree that we'll only be holding half of the chain and the ceiling will hold the other half. So how do I express how much weight of chain I'm holding? Well, this length right here is half of whatever delta x is. Do you guys agree with that? So you write that different. So one half of delta x is how much chain I'm holding here as I pull up with this force. I know that the mass of the chain is m and the length of the chain is l, so this is what I call my linear density. These words don't matter that much to you and won't until next semester, but what I really need to do is find out what percentage of chain I'm holding. And I could think the best way to do that would be to write one half delta x over l times m is the mass of the chain I'm holding. This is the percentage of chain I am holding. And when delta x goes to L, meaning when I go from here all the way to there, I'll be holding half of the chain. Do you guys see why that has to be true? We all good so far? All right, so if I multiply this by G, that's the weight of the chain I am holding. You see how this is a lot like pulling the chain up on the table? Now, all that being said, I can now set up my integral. And it'll have one half, and I'm not going to use delta x here. I use the delta just to mean the change in the position. I'm just going to use x over L times mg dx. This is me setting up the integral to calculate the work. And x is going to start at 0, and it's going to go all the way to L, because I'm going to lift up the chain and bring it all the way to the top. This is assembling an integral. This is the part that's hard. Now, a lot of you are going to say, well, no, all of it's hard. I have no idea what I'm looking at. It's a whole bunch of symbols. And it's too far down on the bottom of the board for me to see because I'm all the way in the back of the room. But anybody who's made it through a course of calculus knows that executing this integral is not hard. They recognize which parts of this are important and which parts aren't. Let me help you recognize which parts are important and which parts aren't. Anything that's not x isn't important. Take all of that and pull it out of the integral. So that will be the, the 1 half, and that will be the L, and that will be the mg. And what I'm left with this integral, all of you should be able to do. It's a polynomial, it's x to the 1 power. And we all should get the same kind of thing here. In fact, uh, my antiderivative will be x squared over 2, evaluated from 0 to L. And I um, still have this. I'm just going to rewrite this as mg over 2L here. And you guys who are hastily writing, um, I, I do want you to write this stuff down. I'm not going to have you do this on tomorrow's test, but there is something about this you could do on tomorrow's test, and I do expect you could do the other thing I'm going to show you. I can't expect this out of you. Not yet. I can only expect it out of students who have had enough calculus. you got to put in your, your limits. So I put in the L, and I subtract putting in the 0. And I see that one of the L's will cancel, and I'm going to get 1 quarter MGL. This has to be the work done in lifting the chain. 
could you guys have figured this out without doing all of this? Yes. All of you who have been in this class who have never had calculus could have gotten this answer without doing this. There's an algebra way to do it. Did you conceive the algebra way? If you didn't, let's conceive the algebra way. Can we all agree that when I take the chain from the way it looks right now to, let me try and do this just right. There, I'm gonna go from from this state to this state. Everything good? How much did the middle of the chain move? That's the center of the chain. The center of the chain is here, right? When I say center, I mean the center of mass of the chain. This is like two chains, each with their center here. So the center of mass of our system went from here to here. How far is that? Based on the length of the chain, how much did the center of mass of the chain change? One fourth. Yeah, I lifted the center of the chain one quarter of L. So the change in potential energy, m g h minus h naught. How much did the center of the change move? It moved one quarter L. That's it. That's the algebra way to do it. Just looking at where the center of the chain is. I would. I'd agree that had you never seen the one where we pulled the chain up on the table yesterday, that you couldn't do this. But we talked about the center of the chain moving yesterday from hanging off the table to being on the table. It's the same problem here. Where'd the center of the chain go? Well, the center of the chain went from here to here. That's what was lifted, the center of mass of the system. Anyways, yay. Will that be on your test? No, I think. What we just talked about here could be on your test, sure. Is, the, is this calculus gonna be on your test? No. No, I got plenty of other stuff to put on that test that isn't this. All right, make sure you do the basics first. And the block is released. Can we agree the block has potential energy? The block makes its way and then encounters the spring. So it has acquired kinetic energy. And then the block begins to compress the spring. So kinetic energy and maybe some elastic. And then the block eventually comes to rest against the spring and we now have all elastic. Agreed? So let's answer the first question. Uh, determine the speed of the block at the instant it hits the end of the spring. It's the first question. To do that problem, I can set this as my baseline for measuring potential energy. Because I can choose the baseline anywhere I want for any point of the problem as long as I'm only making comparisons for that specific question. So right now I can make this comparison. I know how high the block was above this point in spring. I could treat that as the baseline and I have all gravitational potential and all kinetic. This is how you get a one on the AP Physics C exam. You get this question right. Because there's really not a lot here. So it fell 0.45 meters. Determine the period of simple harmonic motion that ensues. You guys can't do that. It's on the equation sheet though. You could just look it up. It's on the equation sheet. And it says the word period for a spring mass oscillator on the equation sheet. 
or it just says period for spring or something like that. Just plug, it's not interesting. This is how you go from a one to a two by grabbing the right equation and plugging it in there. But you'll see two of them. You'll see two pi times the root of L over G. You'll see two pi times the root of M over K. One's for a spring and a mass, one's for a pendulum. All the kids in AP Physics 1 last year which had no trouble with that. Um, it's C and D that are the interesting questions. C and D matter. You see, here's the first problem. Let's talk about question D for a moment. We can't set this amount of potential energy equal to this amount of potential energy. Not without recognizing that the baseline has to move. You see, this has to be the new baseline between those two places. When you calculate mg h minus h naught, it has to be this distance plus whatever it takes to compress the spring. And you don't know how much the spring gets compressed. All you know is that this height is 0.45 meters. So your gravitational potential energy has to include how much the spring is compressed. And you have to deal with the fact that the spring is compressed. So if you want to figure out what's the maximum compression of the spring, you'll have to set this amount of energy equal to this amount of energy. But I know a lot of you didn't. I looked at your work. You just said mg times 0.45 equals 1 half kx squared. That's wrong. It's a pedestrian mistake, and it's an easy one to make. But remember, you have to know where the, the reference level is. When the box is here, it still has gravitational potential energy relative to the lowest spot it will attain. You just don't, have to, you just don't know what the lowest spot is. Um, this produces a quadratic, by the way, and the solution of that quadratic will give you two answers. One of them is positive and one of them is negative. You'll discard the negative answer because that's the idea that the spring could rise up to meet the mass, and that doesn't make any sense. All right, so uh, any question about that? So question C, how much is the spring compressed when the box reaches its maximum speed? Probably a lot of you don't know where to go with that one. Um, that's because you guys think this is where it reaches its maximum speed. And that's not true. And I know a bunch of you say, well, after it touches the spring, isn't it slowing down? No, why would it be? Right now, when it's touching the spring, what forces are acting on it? Name a force acting on the box the moment it touches the spring. Go ahead, Marlon. Normal from the spring? Yeah. Why? F equals kx minus kx. Has the spring been compressed yet? No. So there's no force in the spring yet. What's another force acting on the box? So right now, there's only one force acting on the box, and that's gravity. So it is still speeding up even though it has just touched the spring. In fact, I purposely left the gap in here to consider maybe an intermediate position. There's going to be a spot where it has started to compress the spring. That's true. So if it compresses the spring a little bit, the weight will still be downwards. But we haven't compressed the spring enough for it to start to slow down, right? Still an unbalanced force downwards, so it's still speeding up. It's just not speeding up as much, but it's still speeding up. You forget that in Newton's laws, we don't reach a point where we stop accelerating until the forces are balanced. When the forces are balanced, that's when we reach a point where the acceleration goes to zero. That'll be when it's at its maximum. Before that, it was still speeding up. 
So this is how much the spring has to be compressed in order to be at the maximum velocity. Oh. Now, truthfully, to answer question, the last question, you would have to figure out what that maximum velocity is. But I think we're kind of done here. Do you guys see how this problem works? Yep. So at that point in the spring where like the gravitational energy and the spring force is equal, does the box have... Wait, 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 wait. The gravitational... Like the mg and the ks. Okay, so the forces. You said energy. I'm just oh, trying to make sure we understand what we're talking okay. about. Okay. When they're equal, mm -hmm. um, does the box have kinetic potential and elastic? Yep, sure does. Okay. Now, it has potential relative to the lowest point in the problem. Mm -hmm. So, but yes. I mean, if we're setting this as the baseline, at this moment right here, it has kinetic. In fact, this is the maximum kinetic because it's at max speed. Mm -hmm. And it has some elastic. And it has elastic because it has compressed the spring, whatever this amount is. And it has gravitational because it is above this reference level. Okay. Now, if you wanted to figure out how fast it's going, <laughs> you would have to set all of that equal to this. But I would probably, for that problem, reset the reference level to here so that you get rid of the gravitational potential. Okay. It would be easier on you. Um, there's still a few of you who don't know this, so I'm going to go ahead and just say it. If you want to figure out the actual answer, you have to say kx equals mg and solve for x. That's how far the spring would be compressed when the block makes it to its maximum speed. I assume that you could do the net force equals zero problem, but I can't make that assumption. All springs that are linear obey Hooke's law. So that's the force you get from the spring. KV is, I think we're allowed to use V in our answer. You have an expression for V naught, which you would have gotten by finding, and I'm skipping some of this, but you only asked about the last part. So the, gravita the original gravitational potential energy when it was up there was mg times 3r relative to the lowest point in the problem. And this V naught represents the amount of kinetic energy it has before it reaches the part that's gonna slow it down. Does that make sense, guys? Well, we'll see. So mg times three R equals one half m V naught squared. So this is gonna be our starting velocity for when we hit the part where there's gonna be drag. So I'm just gonna multiply both sides by the two and get rid of the uh, m, and I get v naught equals the square root of 6gr. This is our starting velocity. And you solved this already earlier in the problem, but I just want to have it available. Um, we're going to hit an area where it is experiencing some kind of force of drag that is proportional to the velocity, and that force is this direction, and it's equal to kv. Now, we should probably handle direction. Um, we can make this direction the positive direction if you'd like, or we would make this the positive direction, but this initial velocity then be negative. You just have to choose how you want to deal with the direction here. I don't have a, a favorite, so I'll probably just make this the positive direction and that means my acceleration is negative. Um, net force equals ma, so minus kv equals ma. I have to make a differential equation. Acceleration is dv dt. Whenever we're using Newton's second law to make a, a differential equation, you just have to sub in the differential for the acceleration. So minus kv equals m dv dt. We have written but not solved a differential equation that could be used to find velocity as a function of time. That's it. Yeah? So is the reason that we kept the negative just because of like the direction that we chose? Like could we have, could we have said kv equals m times negative a? 
still would work out to be mathematically the same, and that'd be fine. I just chose to put the negative sign on the direction of the force because that's the way we've been training us to do that. Um, I suspect you can go two more steps. That you could multiply both sides by dt. Splitting your derivative. That you could collect terms. So putting v on the side with v and t on the side with t. And that you could write your integral sign and link together your starting and stopping points. Time zero, V naught equals the square root of 6GR. Some time in the future, some velocity in the future. Still not doing any calculus. Just doing the algebra to get to the calculus. But the problem had you stop here. So that's fine. Just want to keep reminding you that there's a couple of steps to get to the part where there's going to be calculus. Um, this calculus isn't terrible, but um, you can't use the polynomial rule on V. Because <coughs> if you try, you divide by zero. So that one must be something else. So we wouldn't be able to use the polynomial rule here. All right. A force related to velocity. Okay. So there was no spring in this problem. All right. I just, this was a... Really similar I got no, yeah, this is like a drag force or something. Oh, okay. I could have just as easily not used a drag force and used a spring as part of this problem, and maybe tomorrow I will. Okay. But um, just different things are stopping. This KV is, though, generally is a form of drag. Okay. Um, you wouldn't actually use a spring on a problem where there's a person. It tends to be, um, it tends to hurt them. So that's why we don't use spring launching mechanisms. It breaks their necks and stuff like that. So bad for people. All right. So I'm getting a clear signal. You guys are ready. Uh huh. I can try. So the spring on the table? Yeah. So this spring on the table, the launch, uh, this is, this is super common. This is a, a, a very frequent way in which they work in projectile motion into a, into a problem. And, and there could even be more conservation of energy stuff here because the lowest point becomes the floor. But when it comes to a problem like this where we have a spring here, and a box pulled up against it. They say there's no friction on the table anymore, so when the box is over here, I have all elastic potential energy, and then the box gets launched. And so it has now all kinetic energy. If there's nothing to stop the box, it will have that same amount of kinetic energy here. Now, truthfully, it's got potential energy relative to the ground. But all that's going to be good at telling you is how fast the box is going when it reaches the ground. And it'll be a, the velocity like in that direction. But if you want to find out where the block strikes the ground, look familiar? You're going to need to do this. You're solving for the range. Vx is the velocity you have right here. That's the horizontal velocity. Delta y is going to be the height of the table. Vy naught is going to be zero. Uh, don't know what Vy is going to be. That's how fast it's going vertically when it hits the ground. Acceleration is going to be the acceleration due to gravity and you need to figure out how long it's in the air and use that over there. It's a projectile problem tacked on to the end. It's super common, 
super common. So at first, I think we can do 1 half k x squared equals 1 half m v squared. This will give us what our vx is going to be. And canceling out the 1 halves, I'll find that vx is equal to the square root of k over m times x, whatever the spring was compressed. Over here, if I just say that downwards is positive, I'll get that the time is equal to the square root of 2h over g from a motion equation. I don't really want to go through the motion equation, but I will if I have to. Okay. Once I know that, vx is the square root of k over m times x, and t is the square root of 2h over g. So their product determines what r is. So it just looks like spaghetti soup, but or not spaghetti soup, but alphabet soup, but it's just a lot of letters. Square root of k over m uh, times 2h over g, all times x. It just looks like a mess, but all the things are in the proper location, like. If the spring is stronger, it'll shoot it further. Does that make sense? I hope so. If the table is higher, it'll land further away. Does that make sense? I think it does. If gravity is stronger, then it will land closer to the edge of the table. Well, that makes sense. Gravity is pulling down harder. Um, if the mass is heavier, it will be harder to shoot off the spring, and therefore it'll land closer to the edge of the table. That makes sense. And if I pull it back further, it lands further away. That makes sense too. Everything seems to be in the proper place of where it's gonna go. It's just which thing is under the radical and which thing is not. So, yeah, fun times. A, a child on a swing, but I'm going to, to simplify the geometry just to make it easier for us to look at. So, we'll start with just this. Uh, uh, a, a mass at the end of a string. That way it's a little bit easier. I'm not trying to draw anything weird. So a horizontal force is used to pull the child backwards from where they start to here. I, I, I don't know if you know this, but so if you don't, let's kind of uh, pick a middle ground here. As I try to pull the child back, does it take more force to keep going, less force to keep going, or the same force to keep going? So just right now on your paper, which one would require more force? to be at two or be at one. Actually, not even on your paper, just hold up your fingers. And if you, think, if you think they're the same, just give me a closed fist. So am I pulling harder at one, pulling harder at two, or are they the same? My glasses on, go. Don't look around the room. Interesting, hands down. We have a mixed group of answers. By the time I got around the room, I saw some people change their minds. It's the way it goes with these kinds of things. Uh, <coughs> You can prove it right here. This is where we prove it. So let's take a look at the force required to pull them back. Isn't that what we want? Right there, yes, that's, that's question A. So I can only study one of these at a time, but they're all generally gonna have the same free body diagram. We'll have a force in this direction. This is what you are applying as the person who is pulling the child uh, um, on the swing. There will be a force in this direction due to gravity. And there will be a force in this direction due to tension. The, the child is being pulled at a constant velocity or is being held in place. Either way, net force is zero. Any question about the choices that have been made here? Right. Now, because the net force is zero, this conversation 
largely doesn't need, a, a, need to be big, but we have to choose a coordinate system. There, there might be reasons to choose a different coordinate system than what I'm about to choose. But I'm gonna choose the one that is aligned with the two forces that are perpendicular to each other. Now, if this force were suddenly to, to vanish, I might change my mind and choose a different coordinate system. And I'm saying this because if you're, there is a problem where, you know, what is the tension in the cable the instant they are released, where that might require a different coordinate system to answer or to at least get a better answer. So I'm gonna choose a coordinate system that's aligned with these two, but you don't have to stay with that the whole problem. So not particularly well drawn, but that's what we got. Uh, so I'll make this the positive x, I'll make this the positive y, and I'm, I'm spending way more time on this than I'd like to, so let me just cut to it. This is theta, so this is theta. That makes this t cosine theta, and that makes this t sine theta. This is the applied force, this is mg. Any questions about any of those choices? All right, well, I need F in terms of everything but tension. So I need to eliminate tension. I can go ahead and say that net force in the X direction is going to equal zero. Net force in the Y direction is going to equal zero. So it looks to me like F equals T sine theta and T cosine theta equals mg. So if I want to eliminate t, I can either stack these and divide them, or I can solve for t in one and plug it into the other. Um, if you guys don't have a preference, then I'm just going to solve for t here and plug it in over there and get that f <coughs> equals mg tan theta. Any questions about that? And that is the answer. And it answers the question at the beginning. As theta gets bigger, does tangent get bigger or smaller? You don't know the answer? All right, well, we're going to move on now because I think we got part A done. Part B and C are, are asking to do the same thing. But part B is tough. Set up a do not solve an integral that could be used to calculate the work done on the child. So raise your hand if you're in calculus A, B right now. All right, that's a whole lot of you, you see, right? So you are calculus students. The problem with calculus students, raise your hand, do I have any B, Cers in here? Okay. The problem with calculus students is this. Calculus doesn't teach you how to set up an integral. Calculus teaches you how to execute an integral. Setting up an integral is challenging. That's actually the hard part. Um, but calculus isn't prepared for that. So it's like um, you learned your multiplication tables. Well, you're supposed to. So for the most part, if I gave you a, a multiplication to do, you could do it. Now, getting to a point in a mathematical analysis where multiplication is required can be hard. But doing the multiplication, not particularly hard. That's really what calculus is. Doing the antiderivative, that, that's not hard. On the AP exam, you're going to get a point, maybe. Setting up the integral, that's hard. That's valuable. That takes a real understanding of what the integral is about. So this one, this is a tough question. Probably one of the hardest in the homework. Um, I won't need this anymore, really, but... I, I, all I really need is, is this and the picture. So I'm going to get rid of this for right now because I don't need it. And I'm going to get rid of, I guess I don't need any of that because I don't really need it. And that, I'm going to just leave this right here. This applied force is doing work. The real problem is that our definition of work is complicated. It speaks of displacements. The problem is that our displacement is in the direction of an arc. So although we are applying a force 
horizontally, that's not necessarily the direction that the kid is moving. So at this instant, right here in this portion of the picture, if we pull harder, the kid moves this way, a direction that is perpendicular to the cable. Does everybody see what I'm saying? So that's the direction, you know, it's perpendicular to that cable, but that's the direction they move. And this angle keeps getting bigger. Is it not unreasonable, bless you, for you guys to realize that that angle has got to be theta as well? You can do the math on it if you want to see how it works, but that would have to be theta. If we just look at the picture, do you see why it has to be theta now? Or do you need me to explain why it's theta? What was that, Olivia? You see it or you need it explained? Sure. Um, I'd probably have to do some, some geometry. So are you prepared for some geometry? Okay. Let me see, what would be a good way to go? Let's go with this parallel line. You know the alternate interior angles for it. I'm trying to pick functions I think you guys remember. So you remember alternate interior angles? So this has to be theta because of alternate interior angles because this line and this line are parallel. I have two parallel lines cut by a transverse. All right, so now we know that that's theta. Let's get down here. Um, we know that there's a right angle there that I marked. So this has to be 90 minus theta, correct? And this is another right angle here. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and, and I want you guys to see those things. I'm trying to use... There's other ge geometries you could use to get there. Is that okay? All right. In our, um, in our parlance, when it comes to what's happening, if I pull a little harder, do you guys agree that the kid moves a little more? This is dx. This is the small change in the x. The problem is that when I pull a little harder, the angle changes. And that changes this. So I would, it would be better for me to try and put this in terms of theta instead of terms of x. And I know this is something that you guys who have not had calculus and maybe even in calculus don't understand. But I'm trying to find out how much work is done, but I have to do it over how the x changes. But my force isn't based on x, it's based on theta. So I need to transform this to be in terms of theta. So I need to find out how this little arc length is related to theta. Do you have a relationship between, say, theta and arc length? You're supposed to. I don't know that you guys do. But there is a relationship that relates theta to arc length. S is the traditional character used for arc length. So... R represents the, the radius, in this case, the length of the string. So we could write this as dx, a piece of arc, equals a small change in angle times the length of the string. Again, I don't know if you guys know how to do this. I'm just explaining it. And I, I've tried to see if calculus students know this. The BC kids should. Now... There's things to do over here, but it seems to me I can start putting some things together. For example, uh, I can integrate and have F, which is mg tangent theta times, instead of dx, I'll have d theta over L. Um, what am I doing over L? dx times, d theta times L. Help me. Mess that up dx is d theta times L. And then I have to deal with the cosine of the angle between, which we already showed was theta. Any question about what I put here? Okay. Um, that's the work done. I should reorganize this, but I should also realize that tangent is sine over cosine. So 
Do you see that I could cancel out the cosines and make that sign? So this will be the integral of MGL sine theta times d theta. Now we're supposed to figure out the work done. We're starting at an angle of zero, and we will pull them back until they reach theta max, wherever that's going to be. I just need something to be the placeholder for how far back we pull them. This is the work done. This is set up, but do not solve an integral that could be used to figure out the amount of work done in pulling them back. I expect maybe one person in the class can probably do this. If you can't do calculus, don't do this. Don't spend any time on it. But I think if you do calculus, you should be able to do this. And I think if you do calculus, you should be able to do this integral. Um, does anybody know what the antiderivative of sine is with respect to theta? All right, so we, we do know, have at least one person. So we could do this. This is all a constant. This has nothing to do with theta. Pull it out front. So if we're going to execute this integral, mgl out front, the integral of sine theta with respect to theta. And if you don't know this, okay. But the inverse, the antiderivative of sine is co negative cosine. So we have done the antiderivative. We have to apply our boundary conditions, which means putting in the top boundary and then subtracting the bottom boundary. So. I'll put in the top boundary, negative cosine theta max, minus putting in the bottom boundary, cosine of zero degrees. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to factor out a negative sign out front. So I'll have negative mgl minus cosine theta max minus 1. I'm sorry, plus cosine theta max. I factored a negative sign out there. We still good? Um, I think I'm done. This is how much work there is. I mean, I could, I guess, I guess I could do this instead. I could leave the negative sign in there and just reverse these guys and put... 1 minus cosine theta. At least then it'll look like something that we're about to see in a minute. This has got to be done, the work done. This is the work done by the guy pulling on the swing, pulling it backwards. Now, part B is this. Part C says to do it algebraically by finding a change in potential energy. So we talked about Part B a little bit. Let's talk about Part B now, because this is something that I think is an all skate, meaning I think everybody should be able to do this without any difficulty, because we talked about it significantly in class, and I feel confident that you have something in your notes that you can use that will do this. So let me, um, oh, I didn't want to do that. I guess I'm going to leave that little arrow there. Bless you. Remember when I told you that you needed to come up with a way of expressing the height in terms of how many degrees you've pulled the thing up? Do you have it in your notes? Remember we drew a triangle with this? Look kind of like that. And I said to you guys, if the baseline is the lowest point, can you figure out how high you are above the baseline? Did we draw all this? Pretty sure, because there's something about adjacent plus height equals the length of the cord. And you did a little, little geometry, right? Mm -hmm. You do have this in your notes, right? So we do have that H equals L times 1 minus cosine theta. That's in our notes, correct? If this is the baseline, then this is how high we are above the baseline. The change in potential energy has to be equal to MGH, which has to be MGL times 1 minus cosine theta. It has to be the same thing we got before. 
This is how much energy the person gave to the kid when they pulled back on the swing. And it has to be the same amount. You can jump to this in a single step because you're just figuring out how much potential energy there is in terms of H. But then you're transforming H in the things that we're allowed to use, the length of the string and the angle. I'd say that's easier. All right. So I forgot who asked about it. Was there more to this problem you want to talk about? Because there's lots more to this problem, isn't there? You don't want to talk about it anymore? Okay. Yeah? Isaac, can you do D, please? That's a, I think that's a good question to ask. Okay. I think this is worth doing. So the moment we let go, the system's going to accelerate. And it says... What is the tension in the cable the instant they are released? Hint, their velocity the instant they are released is zero. That's important, okay? The velocity is zero. The reason that's important is that net force equals MA. The forces are unbalanced. Is there a centripetal acceleration the moment they are released? The reason I put the hint in there because that hint, this is actually an, a, sorry, this picture, this whole problem is an actual FRQ that was asked a bunch of years ago. So I want you to understand that I put B and C in there because B and C were the same question on that same FRQ, and you could do it either way. You had the same a number of points, three points. So whether you did the calculus or you did it through algebra, you got the same three points. But question D, which was on the actual problem, didn't give you this hint. But centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared over R. If they're not moving, is there any centripetal acceleration? Nope, there's not. What direction are they accelerating? They have a tangential acceleration only. They have a tangential acceleration only. But they do have one. So if we want to find the tension, we have to understand that this is what's happening in the system. What is the tension in the cable the instant they are released? And what is the acceleration of the child the instant the parent releases them? I think these two things are solved simultaneously. So let's begin. Um, net force equals MA. We know that there are only two forces now. There's a gravitational force downwards, and there's the tension upwards. I think it would be best for us to use a coordinate system aligned with the acceleration. So I'm going to use that as my coordinate system. As I said before, if you can, always try and make your coordinate system align with the direction of the acceleration. So that's going to be my positive x direction. I'm going to break mg up into components. And again, I need to know where to put theta. So this is theta. If I continue this over here, that has to be theta because they are corresponding angles. Do you guys remember that from, from geometry? So that means this is theta. That means this is mg cosine theta, and this is mg sine theta. Any questions about those choices? All right. Um, this is going to be in the x direction, and net force in the y direction equals zero. So it looks like tension has to equal mg cosine theta. And what's the acceleration of the system? Well, I'm going to get that here. So it's kind of messy, but I'll write it over here. mg sine theta has to equal ma. I'm going to put a little t there to remind me that this is the tangential acceleration. Um, cancel out the m's, and that's your answer for the acceleration. What is the speed of the child at the bottom of the swing? All right, that one's, that one's easy, uh, or easier. That's where we can use energy. So at the bottom of the swing, I'm going to assume the bottom of the swing is the baseline. And so we have all gravitational potential energy here, 
and all kinetic energy here. That means MGL, one minus cosine theta, equals one half MV squared. I mean, you could do that part, right? Cancel the m's, multiply by 2, take the square root. What is the tension in the cable at the bottom of the swing? Another good question. The bottom of the swing, we have two forces acting. Weight downwards, which hasn't changed. But tension upwards, but the tension has to be greater than the weight. Because at this point, it, they are moving, and they are in centripetal motion. So we need to have a greater tension to make them travel in a circle. They have a velocity here. So net force equals MAC. So tension minus MG equals MV squared over, I'm going to use L here, because the length of the string is the radius of curvature. Am I going too fast? <coughs> All right, I have an expression for V squared over here. It's 2MGL times 1 minus cosine theta. It's messy, but it's already in terms of V squared. So I'm going to substitute it in. Um, when I substitute, the L's are going to cancel. Do you guys see that, or do you want me to write it out first? Well, nobody answered, so I can just do it my way. So T minus MG equals, um, oh, I'm sorry. This M gets canceled out, so there's no M here. I went a little too fast. So M times 2GL times 1 minus cosine theta, all divided by L. What a mess. What a mess. Um, the L's cancel. So I get T minus MG equals 2MG times 1 minus cosine theta. I'm going to get T by itself, but you might not know why I'm about to do this, but I'm going to distribute the 2mg. And the reason I'm going to do that is I'm going to add mg to both sides, and so I knew that there'd be a term here that says 2mg. So when I add mg to both sides, I get 3mg minus 2mg cosine theta. Now you can factor back out the mg if you want, but that's the tension in the string. Oof. That's a good one right there. That, that's a good one. I like that one. It's got all sorts of stuff in it. Block on the table. Looks like I didn't record it. This is most of it. This one? Okay. But only this portion of it, right? Yeah. Alright, well how about I just use what I got here? Okay, so in this problem, I worked it but I didn't record it. So um, this is all the parts of this problem that get you to to, to the part where the the box hits the spring. So just the highlights are, um, these are the forces acting on the box here. Um, the net force in the y direction is zero. That gives you an expression for the frictional force, which you're gonna need. The net force in the x direction isn't zero, and we are told that it accelerates, but we're told that it's not pulled so hard that it's pulled off the table. So using that, that gets you that the, uh, the force in the horizontal direction has got to be equal to F cosine theta minus friction, which equals MA. All good? You combine all of that together, and the person in the class who wanted to do this, here's two ways to find the work done in this problem. 
you can find the work from the individual forces and then add them together, or you can find the work done by the net force. They chose to do the work done by the net force. So the net force is F cosine theta minus friction. That's the net force. And it moves distance D. The angle is the angle between the net force and the displacement. And the net force is along the horizontal axis, so the angle is zero. So that produces the work done. If you want to find out how fast it's going, well, that's equal to the change in kinetic energy, so you can set all of that equal to one-half mv squared and solve it for v. I didn't do that because that just produces an alphabet soup mess, but that is how fast it's going. It's a mess, but this is what it looks like. Any question about that part? Did I go too fast to baffle you so you have no questions? That's good. That's the way it goes. You sure? All right. Suddenly, that force disappears. There's a force acting, of course, but that force, the applied force, disappears. I say, from this point forward, we just say that the block has a velocity in this direction of V. Is that okay? Can't really see that, so we'll say V. That's how fast it's going when it contacts the spring. The instant before it contacts the spring, it has kinetic energy equal to one-half m v squared. Correct? But it hits the spring, and so it compresses the spring, but at the same time, friction's acting on the block. Eventually, the block is going to come to rest, either due to the spring or due to friction, but probably a combination of both, which means the spring will be compressed a distance x, and now we have energy in the spring equivalent to one-half kx squared. All good? Can we agree that the initial kinetic energy has to be greater than the elastic potential energy in the spring? Why? We're losing some energy due to friction. So we could find out how much energy we lost due to friction. We just add it. Now, this is something where you think about it. You can either subtract it from the kinetic energy side or add it to the potential energy side. But we have, if we can account for all the energy, then it's going to be equal. I like doing it this way. I like to add the work done on this side because I feel that that work is now the heat on the tabletop. So that energy is still there. Taking it away sounds like the energy went, is gone or somehow. But I, I like it this way. It doesn't matter, but we do have to realize that, be careful about signs here. The work that we're going to calculate, we're just going to use the absolute value of it. Another way to do this is to say that, and you, some of you might like this better, that K equals whatever the work done is, the uh, potential energy afterwards. But I, I don't like writing it like that. There are other ways for me to express this too, using the work energy theorem. We can do it this way. I just think it's easier to say we had this amount of energy before we hit the spring. And after we hit the spring, we have elastic potential energy and heat all over the table. That's the way I like to say it. Is that okay with all of you? All right. Uh, one half m v squared. No, I'm sorry, what was, yeah, v squared. <laughs> equals one half k x squared plus friction times x. All right, the work done by friction is the size of the frictional force times the displacement of the box. I can't leave it like that, but I can put in 1 half mv squared equals 1 half kx squared plus mu mgx. That's frictional force. Now that the, normal, now that the pulling force is gone, the frictional force is based on the entire normal force, which is mg. Right? That's it. That's the answer. You can't solve this for x. Well, you can. Uh, if you want to solve this for x, this becomes a, this becomes b, and negative this becomes c, and you use the quadratic formula. But remember, v is actually um, all of that. So we could, you know... 
But the real answer, let's do it here, f cos theta minus mu mg plus mu mg, I'm sorry, not mu mg, just mu f sine theta. There we go. That's the actual full answer. Yay! I feel very accomplished today. Solve that for x. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Yay! No, don't solve it for x. If you have numbers, sure. If you don't have numbers, don't. Um, we're at the bottom, but it started off with like a thing up here, right? And when it made it down there, it did a something like that. Um, let me see. I'm going to use the, I'm going to say the platform is my baseline. And the box started, I just need some of this to get us set up. The box started here at a distance at, at, with a potential energy equal to mg times 3r. And then made it down here. with a kinetic energy equal to one half m, I'm gonna say v naught squared, because this is gonna be the initial velocity when the braking system engages. Is that good? So that means v naught equals, let's see, multiply by two, cancel out the m's, square root of two g, nope, six gr. Square root of six gr. That's how fast the, the ride vehicle is going just before it hits the, the brakes. All good? Any questions about where, I, where I'm starting? All right. So with that, suddenly the box experiences a force in this direction that is equivalent to kV. So that is the unbalanced force. I'm going to make this direction the positive direction. Net force equals MA. So I have one force, this one, acting in the opposite direction of my motion. So negative KV equals MA. I'm supposed to create a differential equation that could be used to find the velocity as a function of time. I have an equation here that has a differential in it, so I just have to express the differential. So kV equals m dv dt. That's it. Um, that's where I start. All you have to do is create a differential equation. That's all you have to do. Now, I expect you can do a little more than this, can't you? Do I ask you to do more? Yeah, all right, so we can't all solve it, but many of us could. Well, maybe one of us or two of us could. The other class had a lot more people there in calculus, but even they couldn't do it. Um, I expect everybody in this room can do the next three steps. Step one, separate your differential. We've talked about doing this. I expect you can do that. Next, collect terms. The T's on the side with DT, the V's on the side with DV. Separate the differential, collect terms, set up your integral. So integrate both sides. Put in your boundary conditions. So at time zero, the velocity is the square root of 6gr. The top boundary is some velocity in the future, at some time in the future. I like that was a good nod back. Way to catch your head from falling off. Good one. Appreciate that. I like a good nod back. Every student's a little different. There's the nod backers, the nod forwarders. 
Every once in a while, I get an odd cider, but not very often. Usually, it's a forward or a backward. Um, not everybody can do the next part, and I wouldn't expect it on your test. Um, I, I do expect that everybody can do the part on the left, because on the left, there is no t. So the unspoken rule is that that's t to the 0 power. That makes this a, a polynomial where you could figure out the antiderivative, which is just going to be t to the 1. So this is evaluated from 0 to t. So this is just negative kt. I, I do expect that you can do that. I'm not convinced you guys could do this one. Some of you can. So those of you who haven't had calculus, you can't do this next part. Let's pull the m out because we don't need it there. Um, there is an antiderivative for 1 over v. I have talked about it in class, but many of you don't know it. But what is the antiderivative of the inverse? The natural log. So this is going to be m times the natural log of v evaluated from the square root of 6gr to some velocity in the future. Which means, I didn't give myself very much space. Okay, the only thing that's calculus is here to here, right? Antiderivative and plugging in your limits. So that's going to be m times natural log of v. It's a function of t minus natural log of the square root of 6g. That's the only part that's calculus. Now, all of you successfully had Algebra 2, which means you should be able to tease out V as a function of T. Because you all like the grade you got in Algebra 2. So you should be able to do that. Probably involves you raising both sides to a base E and stuff like that. You're supposed to be able to do it. I believe in you. Um, before we even do the problem, let's do the algebra problem first. Because the algebra problem is so radically easy that it makes the calculus problem, um, I think, reasonably comparable. The algebra problem is asking about how much energy it takes to pull this kid back on the swing. So I think this is a, a decent enough picture for this. Is that all right? If I just want to find out how much energy it takes to pull the kid backwards, assuming they are pulled back in such a manner as to only have a change in their height, that we're not providing a, um, a change in kinetic energy, then can we agree that if this is the baseline, I just need to figure out how much energy potential energy they have here. This is what problem C asks in this question. Do you guys know which question I'm talking about? And do you have part C in front of you? All right. We talked about how to do this and you have it in your notes, correct? A way of figuring out H in terms of theta and L. That's in your notes, correct? So you should be able to say that at this point, the gravitational potential energy is MGH. But to put it in terms we're allowed to have in our answer, that's going to be mgl times 1 minus cosine theta. Very straightforward. A pure algebraic and geometric solution. But question B asks for you to find the force, I'm sorry, find the work done through integration. So we know what the answer is going to look like because this has to be the amount of energy it has at the end. It, it's not going to change that portion. So we'll just set that over there. That's got to be our answer. And we'll get rid of all this stuff that's unnecessary for doing the problem the way you have to do it if you want to find the work done using a force. Now, this is a good exercise in setting up an integral. Um, let's start by realizing we are going to need to know uh, the size of the force in terms of the other parameters, which is why there's question A. 
Question A is about setting up a free body diagram and getting an expression for the force. By the way, this force that we're pulling this way, does it increase or decrease as the angle gets bigger? So as the angle gets bigger, does this force get bigger? Like, do you have to pull harder? Do you, how many of you know the answer to this or would just be guessing? Raise your hand if you would just be guessing. Be honest. Okay. You understand you don't have to guess. Right? We can prove it. So if you don't know the answer, either you're out looking at your answer right now or you have no answer to look at. So let's consider that there are three forces. There's the adult pulling horizontally. There is gravity pulling downwards. And there's the tension pulling at an angle. The three forces acting on the kid. Tension, applied force, mg. Net force equals zero. Right? We're pulling the kid at a constant speed to this position. Or we're pulling them back and holding them there. All OK? So I'm going to choose a coordinate system that is aligned with the most number of forces. This seems like the right choice. And since I, I think I can go pretty quickly through this, so I will. Um, this angle is theta. This has to be the component of tension in the y direction. And this has to be the component of tension in the x direction. I'm kind of blowing through this because we've done this before. Any questions? So I want this in terms of everything but tension. Tension can't be in my answer. So I note that that applied force equals T sine theta. And I also notice that mg equals T cosine theta. And it seems to me that F equals mg tan theta. We've done this before, so I feel like I could buzz through that and that's pretty quick. So now do you have my answer to my earlier question? Does it take a constant force to pull this to the side, an ever increasing force, or an ever decreasing force? Ever increasing. And I, look, you're not guessing. And I found out last class period, you don't know the answer to this. So I want, I, I take your calculator out. Prove something to yourself. Because I, I need you to be better. You guys learn math, but the problem with what you learn in math is you have no connection to math and reality. Unfortunately, angle increases. And what you really have to understand is, does sine increase or decrease under your interval? Does cosine increase and decrease under your interval? Does tangent increase or decrease under your interval? I know that across the whole spectrum of a circle, sine is getting bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. So you, I'm not asking a random question. Our problem, pulling back on the swing, starts at zero and doesn't get any bigger than 90, right? So with your calculator, put in sine of 10, sine of 20, sine of 30. Is the number getting bigger? Put in cosine of 10, cosine of 20, cosine of 30. Is the number getting bigger? And do the same thing for tangent. I'm saying that because if I say, is tangent getting bigger as angle gets bigger, I want an answer and I want it fast. I, I, I want you to be thoughtful, sure, but these are things you need to know. Sine gets bigger as the angle gets bigger. Cosine gets smaller as the angle gets bigger. And tangent gets bigger as the angle gets bigger. In fact, just looking at this, if I get past 45 degrees, it takes more force than the kid freaking weighs, right? Because tangent of 45 is 1, and then the tangent gets bigger than 1 after that. Pretty soon, I'll be having to push or pull, I'm sorry, pull, with twice the kid's weight, and I'm barely moving them. These are things you should know. This is why if you ever pull a kid back on a swing, you probably don't pull them back very far. Right? You start reaching a point of diminishing returns. All right, well, I've had my bit of a tirade. We'll keep going. But this is the force. 
we now have an expression for the force required to pull the, per, the, the, the kid back. Put that over here. I don't need any of this stuff anymore. It's all useless to me because it, it served its purpose. It gave me a function. This is the force that's going to do work. So now let's uh, assemble our, our integral. Work equals the integral from zero to some angle of f dot dx. All right, let's, uh, let's handle some problems we got here. I have an expression for that force now. And I want to draw this a little straighter. This is the direction of the force. The problem is that if I increase the force, the kid's not going to go in the direction of the force, are they? Based on the geometry here, if I increase the force, the kid will move this way. They are constrained to move in a bit of a circular path, so they're going to move perpendicular to that tension. It's the only way they can move. In fact, the whole thing suggests that they never move linear. They move with an arc, right? So although this little thing represents how much they move when I increase that force, this is my dx. It's really an arc length. It's not a straight line. You guys recognize that? Now, here, here's my problem. I'm talking about pulling them back, starting from an angle of zero to some angle that's a max, something at the end, some, wherever I'm going to pull it back to. The problem is that the equation about work is about the displacement. If I want to assemble an angle, the, or, I'm sorry, assemble an integral, the first thing I'm going to try and do, first thing I'm going to try and do is replace f with mg tangent theta. And the first thing I realized by doing that is I know that if theta changes, their displacement changed. But I have this in terms of dx, not d theta. So I have to either convert tangent theta into something about the displacement, or I have to convert the displacement into something about theta. You guys in calculus should be able to help me with this, because if nothing else, you have an expression that relates a change in angle to a change in arc length. Got awful quiet. Well, okay, then how about I open up to the whole room? Since all of you passed geometry and feel happy with that A you got, you should be able to tell me from geometry how to calculate an arc length based on an angle subtended by that arc. But it is buried inside the equation for circumference. Arc length equals angle times radius. You see how circumference is buried in that, right? If I go around a circle two pi times, I get circumference. As long as I make sure my angle is measured in radians, of course. So. A small change in arc would have to be equivalent to a small change in angle times the radius. All right, calculus. This small change in arc is dx. It's the displacement. So, mg, actually I guess I can put it up here. Instead of dx, I'm going to put d theta, not times r, but times l, because the string is the radius. All good so far? Last thing, the dot product. I need to deal with the angle between the, the displacement direction and the force. That's this angle. Right? You see why that's true? Because this is my force but this is the direction I'm moving. Um, it's theta. 
Everybody know why? You sure? Because you guys were masters at geometry, so you should be able to tell me why. Go ahead. These two, I don't think are corresponding. I think if I drew, because corresponding angles are about having two parallel lines, and I think that would be the corresponding angle. But we're getting there, aren't we? Because if that's the corresponding angle and that's theta, this has to be a right angle. So this has to be 90 minus theta, and this has to be a right angle, making this theta again. Got it all? Because you know geometry. Not really, but I like to think you do. Again, all the things you've learned that are gone, but that is theta. All right, so we're good to go. I've proven it to you. Feel confident-ish? So that just means over here, cosine theta. All right, we've got all the pieces. Yay, work. Now, this is an integral, so let's just go ahead and move all that other stuff out of the way, and we'll do the, the integral math, because I have all these, these calculus people. Um, let's reorganize this a little bit. Again, from zero to theta max. Um, tan theta times cosine theta. Sine theta, right? Uh, so bring the L on the inside of the theta, so it's inside my parentheses, and I get M, G, L, sine theta theta, d theta. All right, calculus folks. Here we go. This Setting up the integral, that's the hard part. This integral, super easy. All right, I'll pull the MGL out for those of you who are, don't know any calculus because this is the most basic trig integral there is. It's just the antiderivative of sine. So you guys in calculus, what is the antiderivative of sine? It is negative cosine. So negative cosine theta evaluated from zero theta max. So there, we've done, all, we've done almost all the calculus. Remember, the calculus was just the part where we went from here to here. That's all you learn in calculus. This is the hard part. That's why they want you to set up but do not solve an integral that could be used to find the work. That's where the real stuff is. Your calculus is just your multiplication tables. You had to memorize that the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. That's something they memorized. None of them probably remember how to derive that from the fundamental theorem of calculus. Maybe they do, but that's not been my experience with students. So, um, the next part of an integral is to plug in your limits. So this will be minus cosine theta max, minus negative cosine zero degrees. This is work. We're getting there. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Are you, are you ready? We all good? Yeah. What's the problem over there? What are we arguing about? No, no, no. She doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't believe the fundamental theorem of calculus? Um, cosine of zero degrees is one, right? Yeah. Negative times negative is positive, so one minus cosine theta equals the work done. Good enough? That's the energy that the person gave to the system. The problem is that this was also work done by a gravitational force. Um, if you want to really go back through this, and understand it better, you should redo the problem. And I'm saying this to like three of you. You should redo the problem and show that the work done by gravity is the same but negative. You should do that. Because this is the work done by a non-fundamental force, me lifting up on the, on the kid. But the work done by gravity has to be the opposite of this so that the change in potential energy equals minus the work done. So if you do this from the standpoint of this force, you'll get negative um, MGL times one minus cosine theta. So we did the work from the applied force. So you should try it. The tension never did any work because the tension was always perpendicular to the path that the object moved. 
but try. It's a good practice if you want to see if you're really catching on to this. Um, do you need me to do the, the work portion before that or just when the external force is released and the box keeps moving towards the spring? Just the external force. Just the external force? Okay, so we're, we're talking about this problem. Right? Well, let me, make sure. let me make sure we're talking about the same problem.